It's strange to think that all the great rivers of the world, the Amazon, the Nile, the Mississippi, have the same humble beginnings, a few teacupfuls of water bubbling out of the ground. Then, as it hurries down to the sea, gathering momentum and force, it changes from a tiny, sparkling skein of water into a broad, majestic river. Rivers are the veins and arteries of the land, and along their glittering lengths, they give homes and food to a colorful band of creatures that live in, on, or alongside them. This is the River Wye in Wales, and Lee and I are going to travel down it from its first waterfall-laced beginnings to the calm lower reaches to see the animals that make it their home. In its upper reaches, a river seems to just thrash about in a wild turmoil, cold water and bare stones. You'd think that nothing could take this beating except maybe some ferns and these mosses that hug the rocks and thrive on spray. But still, this part of the river is prime feeding ground for something entirely unexpected. The dipper hunts on the riverbed. In the breeding season, the parents must gather extraordinary quantities of food in order to satisfy their demanding babies. In a sort of amateur chorus line, the youngsters wait for their parents to return. Dippers often hunt completely submerged, gripping pebbles with their toes and occasionally flapping their strong stubby wings to stay under. Young dippers grow as big as their parent before taking the first hesitant step into the water to learn how to fend for themselves. The dipper strongly defends its particular stretch of river, but what makes him want to live here? There are several ways to find out. Now, I know it looks as though I'm panning for gold, but as a matter of fact, I'm panning for something much more important, at least much more important from the dipper's point of view. What I'm panning for are the little invertebrates that live in streams like this. Sometimes, to your surprise, a pile of pebbles will walk away. This is the caddis fly larva. He spins a tube around himself and then covers it with pebbles. The result is a strong little house, the small stones held in place by a mortar of silk. His home not only protects and conceals him, but it also weighs him down and helps prevent him from being swept away by the current. Black fly larvae make a sort of cushion of mucus on the rocks, and they attach themselves to this with the aid of a ring of hooks at the end of the body. They seize particles of food with strange comb-like bristles. It's extraordinary to see an animal apparently feeding itself with its own moustache. When the lava wants to move, it loops its way cautiously across the rocks, turning its body into a croaky hoop in the way that some land caterpillars do. The side-swimming shrimp has another way of beating the force of the river. Its body is flattened, so it gives the least resistance to the current. And this shape also enables it to slide between rocks and into slender crevices where it can wedge itself firmly and avoid being twitched downstream by the current. The feather-like tail of this mayfly larva is covered with tiny pressure receptors, which allow the larva to orientate itself so it faces upstream. Along the sides of its body, small feathery gills beat the waters like miniature propellers, extracting the oxygen. Its long legs and claws give it a good foothold on the rocks as it browses on the algae that grow there. Another sort of caddis larva turns the current to its own advantage. 
it spins a net over the mouth of its cave and sticks stones to it to prevent it being swept away. Crouching behind its curtain, the larva waits for the current to fill its net with food. Now here's a method that you can borrow from the net spinning caddis. It's an excellent way of collecting the stuff that lives on the bottom of the river. It takes two to kick sample. While Jerry held the net open downstream, I stirred the pebbles around upstream, doing a sort of naturalist hokey pokey. The creatures are dislodged from their pebbles and swept into the net by the current and on into a plastic bottle. This is not something from Star Wars, but rather the face of a humble crayfish. With jaws as complex as the inside of a watch, the crayfish shreds its food. It rummages through the pebbles for plants, insects, and snails, anything edible, in fact, alive or dead. Because crayfish require clean water with plenty of oxygen, they're extremely sensitive to pollution. Their presence means that the river is still healthy. The rim of a bicycle wheel with a net stretched over it makes a good crayfish trap. Bait it with a heavy lump of meat and leave it on the stream bed in the evening. Crayfish are most active at night and you should find them still prowling round the bait early the next morning. This agile, handsome riverside predator, with its black bandit's mask, is the polecat. At one time, polecats were found all over Great Britain, but gradually their numbers dwindled owing to persecution, and they almost disappeared. Luckily, however, a small population survives in Wales, and this is now on the increase. The female polecat, or Jill as she is called, gives birth to four or five kittens in a cave, where she's constructed a comfortable nest of grass and moss. The young are blind at first, but their eyes open when they're a month old, and at three months, they're ready to leave the den and hunt their own food. Their menu is extensive, ranging from fish and frogs to beetles and birds. It's to be hoped that the Welsh population of polecats will eventually repopulate areas in England and Scotland where it's become extinct. So the upper stretches of a river are not at all lifeless. There are plenty of animals there, small and specialised to cope with this youthful upstream exuberance. Still, a stream must grow up and it's fed by water from the tributaries and it becomes deeper, wider and much, much more powerful. To understand this tremendous power, let the river tell you itself. It races and leaps and surges forward, treating you and your kayak as nothing more than a matchstick. Now, when you learn to canoe, you soon find out that the river is not like a conveyor belt just moving uniformly long at a single speed. It's really more like a highway, and there are fast lanes, the rapids, and then, of course, there are those welcome rest areas, like the one I'm in now, and they're called eddies. The animals of the river know where these eddies are, and use them to rest from the force of the current. The bullheads seek shelter behind and under stones. It's a broad little fish, a good shape for squatting beneath things. 
Because of its shape, it's also called the miller's thumb. Millers used to roll the grain between their thumb and fingers to test its quality. And as a miller became an old man, his thumbs became flatter and broader. Each bullhead has its favorite stone, returning there after darting out for insect larvae or shrimp. The eggs are laid in a depression scooped out beneath a stone, and the clutch is relatively small for fish. A large female may lay only 250 eggs. But because the male stays to protect and care for them, most of them survive to hatching. Even fish much larger than the bullhead make use of the quiet stretches. The brown trout normally feeds on insects out in the rushing current, but takes an occasional rest break in an eddy. As the river slides through the countryside, it gets broader and more placid, though the current is still strong. These stretches of the river are the haunt of many water birds. The coot, with its curious bald pate, is a powerful swimmer and can cope with the current. But its nest, a large platform-like structure of reeds and leaves at the edge of the water, is built in an eddy so that the young are not washed away. Its young, at this age, are quaint-looking little things, with their yellow down jerseys and red faces that make them look as though they were suffering from chronic high blood pressure. They are the punks of the riverbank, but nevertheless their mother slaves over their welfare patrolling the river, searching for suitable bits of food for them. Swans could be described as the giraffes of the river, for they can reach food at a depth which the coots have to dive for. However, this does present difficulties for their young, because at this age, they have not developed their parents' long necks. Instead of taking food to its brood, as the coots do, the swans take their babies out to dine. They tear up bunches of bottom weed, which they throw casually and elegantly over their shoulders to be feasted on by their flotilla of fluffy young. The river is the nursery for the waterfowl, and the small tributaries that flow into it are fish nurseries, and this is the place to catch them. Now, there are a lot of quite ordinary things that you can turn into fish traps. Take a plastic bottle, for example, you punch some holes in it, and then you cut off the top, and you reverse the top, and you put it in like that. And then, of course, you bait it, and the fish swims in here but can't swim out again. This is all right for still water but it's not all right for a fast running stream like this because it gets washed away being plastic. What you need is a totally different kind of fish trap with a heavier bottle. And you can bait it with nothing more exotic than just some bread. What you do is cut a hole in the bottom of the bottle, tie some gauze over the neck and sink it in the brook with the neck facing upstream. The secret is to use a bottle with a dimple in the bottom so that the fish are funneled into the trap easily. But once inside, this shape makes it much more difficult for them to get out. At the other end, the gauze stops the fish escaping, but allows the current to flow through the trap so they can breathe. This funnel principle is the basis of many different types of fish trap.
jam jar full of water heats up quickly on a warm day, which can kill the fish. So it's a good idea to keep the temperature constant, like this. Bottle traps are fine for minnow-sized fish, but you'll need to use another method for anything bigger. Stretch two nets across the stream to confine the fish in a small area. Then try your luck with a hand net. But netting is not as easy as it looks. You have to stand without moving your legs at all because the least vibration in the water will scatter the fish. The common fish here are just as fascinating as any exotic tropical species, so it's worth taking a few back home for a closer look. If you're catching fish for your aquarium, you want to keep them nice and comfortable on their way home. The simplest way to do that is to wrap the jar in a bit of damp cloth that keeps the water from heating up. Or you can simply put your jars in a picnic cooler. But if you've got any distance to go and you need to keep the water fresh, you simply use a battery-powered air pump. The small fish of the brook attract a predator so ferocious that it's earned the name of water wolf. It's a young pike who's moved into the brook from the main river to lie and wait for fish of a size he can handle. He's perfectly camouflaged for his hiding place in the weeds, and he hangs motionless there, invisible to this unsuspecting minnow. is hit squarely in the middle of its body, hooked fast by the pike's backward pointing teeth. This rambunctious little predator, the mink, doesn't really belong here at all. Brought originally from North America for their elegant pelts, many of these fierce carnivores escape from the fur farms and establish themselves on the riverbanks living largely on fish and water birds. The water vole, one of the most charming inhabitants of the riverbank, is a chubby and very appealing little rodent, which the mink finds a useful addition to its diet. With his keen sense of smell, the mink can trace water voles even in their underground homes. As a protection against unwelcome visits like this, the water vole, very wisely, builds a secret passage from his nest that allows him to escape into the water. But the mink is also an excellent swimmer. This time, the vole escapes. However, the mink is not hungry for long. He wrestles an eel from the river and scrunches it up like a stick of celery.
Now, what is the largest predator on the river, the king of the river, the otter? Well, in recent years, its numbers have declined so drastically that now you're extremely lucky if you can find a footprint like this. Thirty years ago, otters were very common here. But then, with the increasing use of pesticides, their numbers started to decline because the pesticides used on the fields were washed into the rivers. Well, now, of course, there's much more control over this sort of thing. But even so, the otters' numbers have not recovered in the way that we would like. These wonderful riverbanks, thickly overgrown, the tree roots forming basket-like caves where the soil has washed away, were once the happy hunting ground of the otter. Now they are no longer found here. We try and turn our rivers into canals by straightening them, by dredging them, and by cutting down the trees on the banks in case they fall and produce floods. In addition, we graze our domestic stock right down to the river's very edge, and they eat the young trees and prevent regeneration of that vital rim of tree growth. Without the shade of the trees, the water temperature is altered. This affects the insects, which affects the fish, which affects the otters. Now, there are lots of different ways that we can help the otter make a comeback. We can stop grazing on the river margins, for example, and we can replant where the trees have been knocked down. We can also have stricter control over dredging and straightening of rivers. That's in the long term. But in the short term, you can help by making these very desirable riverside residences for the otters. Piling up logs and branches like this until you have what looks like a gigantic bonfire provides a shelter for the otter. There is evidence that the otters appreciate these dens or holts and are starting to use them, which is very exciting. However, it's only a start. As well as this, we must stop destroying the otter's habitat and make sure that our rivers are clean. Oh, that's pretty good. The architect couldn't have done it better. Then, perhaps, we will have the enchantment of watching the exuberant, acrobatic grace of these lovely animals once again in our rivers and streams.